So today we're continuing our discussion about quadratics. So we're going to graph these things. That's, that's our first thing we're going to do. And then we get to play around with the graph and get a calculator. So we're going to find the important parts of a, of a uh, quadratic. I gave you a blank to fill in today. All right, I'll wait a second there if you have an audio. So that's basically it. Graphing and calculator stuff. Okay, we ready? Let's press the. All right. So you guys are familiar with this, right? That y equals x squared looks like a parabola. I don't think you need to really write this thing down. Um, so the graph of a quadratic is what's known as a parabola. So be aware of that vocabulary. Um, now how to graph a parabola, this, this slide you'd want to write down. Okay. So. Okay, so this thing is going to play the same role that it did with the absolute value function. Remember what that was on the absolute value function? It was our vertex. It was our vertex. And the same thing happens with the H, the one in parentheses. Um, it changes its sign. You guys, did, did you guys watch the, the SAT help fund yesterday that um, Mr. McMillan did? Remember how he had parentheses too and he changed the sign? That's how it works with these transformations. So the ones that are in parentheses change their signs, right? But this K does not. So keep that in mind. You might, if you need to write it, go ahead. But basically the H changes its sign. Now on the, on the, um, on the absolute value function, you guys remember what this thing was? That was our slope. Now here's the thing. A, uh, an absolute value function has pretty much just two slopes, one on the right, one on the left. Okay, But it's always the same. It's always over and up the same amount so that you get a straight line. Okay, Parabolas are not like that. Parabolas go over and up a certain amount, but the next time they go over, they go up higher. And then the next time they go over, they go up even higher. And what that does is that causes the line to start to bend. So parabolas do not have a constant slope. Their slope is changing and they get this bending thing. So it's not really fair to say that this is the slope anymore. Okay, But there still are some things that hold true. You remember how the uh, absolute value function, if the a was positive, it, it went upwards, and if it was negative, it went downwards. That's still true. And something else that's still true is if you think of transformations, when you multiply by a number greater than 1, it stretches it, right? That, that applied to absolute value functions. The bigger the slope, the more it grows, so you got a stretch function. Well, the same thing applies to quadratics. It's just that all these different slopes all get stretched. So it still stretches if it's bigger than 1, and it still compresses if it's less than 1, okay? So to help you kind of, we're not going to be really precise about getting points here. Instead, we're just going to sketch a rough estimate. Um, if you ever want to get precise, you can only just plug numbers in and get exact points. But here's how we're going to handle it. We're going to look at two things, okay, simultaneously. We're going to decide... Is the A positive or is it negative? Okay, so that tells us it's going to be a happy face or a sad face, right? Upside down or right side up. The other thing we're going to look at is, is the absolute value of A greater than 1? If so, then it's, it's stretched. Well, let me... Um, I'm writing this probably a little bit too long. I think I'm going to pull the table. Okay. So, first of all, if the absolute value of A is a number bigger than 1, it gets stretched. 
And since A is positive, it would be stretching upwards. So you can have like a skinny U shape going upwards. Whereas if it was, if the absolute value of A is greater than 1, but the A is negative, it's still stretched, but it's upside down in that case. Okay? Now, if the absolute value of A is less than 1, like a fraction amount, then what happens is the graph is going to, it's going to look wide. Now, I could say it's compressed, just to stick with the same vocabulary, but I think something that would look, make a lot more sense is if we just say it's going to look wider. So, it's going to look wider. Now, since the A, in this row, if the A is positive, it's going to look wide and it's going to go up, whereas down here it'll be wide and go down. Okay, so the final thing, which I probably should add a new row on here, is what if just A isn't greater than 1? What if it's not less than 1, but what if it equals 1? Then what we're going to say is it's normal, whatever that means. Okay, so if this is skinny and this is wide, then maybe normal would look like this. So that's that's kind of how we're gonna do it. Now, um, I didn't. I'm not memorizing this chart, and you guys could. I mean, you could put this on a flashcard and memorize it. I think that's a lot. But I. But what I do remember is that positive means up, negative means down, and I also remember from my transformations, stretches and compression. So, I if I think of it in those groups, I have less to memorize. But this is just a way to organize everything that's happening there. Yes. Now notice I put the absolute value of A is greater than 1 and the absolute value of A is less than 1 because the sign of the A does not affect the stretch or wideness. It's the size of the A. So the sign just tells us what direction it's going. So I wouldn't want you guys to think, for instance, if I put negative 2, I wouldn't, you think, I wouldn't want you to think, oh, that's less than 1, so it's going to be wide. That's not true. It's being stretched because the absolute value is greater than 1, but it's upside down because of the negative. So, <clears throat> so are you considering this as greater than 1? That's right. So here's how I would, I would have you guys think about it. Take the absolute value of it and then ask yourself, is that greater than 1 or less than 1? Oh, okay. okay. All right. So that's all that we really need. Um, we're going to get our vertex, and then we're going to look at the transformations of, that the A creates for us. And then from there, we should be able to just sketch a rough picture of what it looks like. Okay, and that, that's it. It's not going to be a very precise picture. And like I said, you can always get more precise pictures by just picking numbers to plug in and get them. Okay. So let's go ahead and start here. Go ahead and write down example one, please. All right, so when we're graphing our quadratics then, based on our previous discussion, we have three things that we want to look at, okay? First of all, we want to identify what is my vertex. The next thing we want to do is we want to know, is it up or down? The next thing we want to do is we want to know, is it wide, stretched, or normal. So we have to do those three things. And once we know that, we're pretty much set to graph it. So what's the vertex? It's 2, negative 3, right? We take this number, put it there. We take this number, we put it there. Don't forget, for this one here, you're going to change its sign. So it goes from negative 2 to positive 2. Cool, thank you. 
Um, so that's my vertex. The next thing we need to do is we need to ask ourselves, is it a happy face or a sad face? It's a sad face. Since I've got a negative there, that tells me it's going to be a sad face. The next thing we need to decide, is it wide, stretched, or normal? And so take a look at this number here. Is that number greater than 1 or less than 1? Yes. So, uh, why did you put negative 3? Why did you put negative 3? It should be negative 3. Thank you, Xana. Xana was right. We don't change the K, just the H. Good looking. All right. So, now this half, since it's half, what is that? Is that wide, stretched, or normal? It's Remember, if the absolute value of A is less than 1, it's going to be wider looking. Okay, so we have our three things that we need. We now know that what the vertex is. We know which direction it's going, and we know whether it's wide, stretched, or normal. We don't really know how wide it's going to be. We're just going to estimate. But let's go ahead and graph it. So you start with your vertex, over 2, down 3. Now what I want to do is I want to put a parabola on that dot so that that's its vertex and it needs to be upside down and wide. Ready? Would you guys say that looks wide? Would you say that looks upside down? There you go. That's all we're doing. We're not being very precise here. We're just estimating. Okay? Shall I clear it? Okay. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I want to treat this kind of like a guided practice. which means we're going to kind of go through step by step. So here's the first thing I want you guys to do. I want you to write down what you think the vertex is. Go ahead. You want to check your answer with the neighbor. You're welcome to. I'm calling in a few seconds here. So let's ask Amaya, what's our vertex, Amaya? Correct. The next thing I want you guys to do is decide if it's a happy face or sad face. So go ahead and ponder that for a second. I need to shuffle my cards so you guys don't know when I'm coming at you. I'm not surprised and scared. I don't shuffle well, though. What do you think, Amber Shaw? Happy face or sad face? Um, sad face. Why do you think it's a sad face? What's negative? The four. You're right. So you're right about the four being negative. And you're also right that a negative would make it a sad face, but the problem is it's not, that's not the number we look at. The number we look at is this one here, so what do we want to say? That's a happy face, yeah. So we're going to go with happy face here. All right, next one I want you guys to look at is I want you to tell me is it, I'm going to abbreviate it with wide, stretched, or normal with WS and in, I'll get the radio station. See if you guys decided that's going to be wide, stretched, or normal. Thank you. 
Gabrielle, what do you think, my dear? Wide stretched or normal? I agree, because this number is greater than 1. The absolute value of it is greater than 1. So now I want you guys to go ahead and try to sketch it. For that one, before I put the answer up, I'll just kind of let you guys do it. I'll kind of walk around and see how things are looking. Right 3, down 4. Skinny and up. How skinny? We don't know. Actually, eh, no, that's not always going to work. I guess, I guess here's what you could do. If you want to be a little bit more precise, what you could do is, what this will do is that number will tell you the first rise. So, for instance, if you were to go over 1, then basically you would go up 3. But the next rise will not be 3. The next, the next rise will be greater than that. Okay. So this number can tell you your first rise. All right, that's true. Now, the, the reason why I don't teach it that way explicitly all the time is because, let's say I put a fraction there. I'm afraid somebody might go over three, I'm sorry, up three over four. That won't work. You guys know why? Because if I went over, um, for three over one, it does work. Because if I go over one, it does go up three. But the problem is here, how many am I going over? Every time you go over, it gets steeper. So you can't go over 4 and up 3 because every time you go over 1, it goes up steeper and steeper. So, but what you can do is you could go, you can make this like a weird fraction. You say, okay, suppose I had 3 fourths. You could make it 3 fourths over 1. What you could do then is you can go over 1 and up 3 fourths. That'll work. Okay? So you just got to be careful with that. But, if you don't care about being that precise, you don't need to be. It's not a big deal. I think, you know, this can be a multiple choice test, and you're going to be able to tell which one it is, I think, just by looking. Um, all right, let's go ahead and write down number two here. Number two is going to be interesting. Three-day <clears throat> numeral. Okay, we're missing some numbers here, guys. What are we missing? And I want letter names. Are we missing A? Are we missing H? Or are we missing K? Yeah, please. Uh, a and H. We're missing A and H. Good job. So let me let me show you. We know it looks like this, right? We have an A here. The X is always there. You'll never be missing an X. The H goes here, and the K goes here. Now, do I have a number in front of the X squared? No, so I'm missing that one, right? So we need to know what that is. Um, do we have something in parentheses being squared with the X here? So we're missing that number that should be in parentheses being squared with the X. Um, so that means this guy over here must be the k right so we have our k but we're missing our a and h so do you guys remember what happens if we're missing the a what is it equal to missing a one. one and what happens if you're missing the other two that's right if you're missing h or k they equal zero Okay, so in this case, if I were to fill in my blanks, this would be a 1, and this would be a 0. So now that I've shared that with you, I'm going to let you guys go ahead and graph the whole thing. Okay? Um, I'm going to ask you three, four questions on this. I'm going to ask you, what's the vertex? Which direction is it going? Happy or sad? Wide stretched or normal? And then I'm going to ask you to share, or I'll look at your guys' graphs to make sure you're getting it right. But there you go. What, again, actually, John, what is our vertex? Good. All right. Next, I'm going to ask Sam, happy or sad face? 
Okay. And Melanie, wide stretched or normal? Because it equals one, right? So since that number is positive, we have this happy face. And since it equals one, then it's a normal. So we would expect the vertex to be here at three and a normal sized U shape going upwards. Okay. Or you can be specific and use the slope up one over one. Okay. Just be careful with the ones that are fractions. We talked about that. All right. Um, so let's talk about the parts of a quadratic. I think I printed the picture, but I didn't put the labels in there. So I'll let you guys go ahead and fill in your labels there. So the place where the parabola touches the x-axis gets a name. Did they just decide to name that arbitrarily? No, because actually when you use parabolas in real life, the roots are actually very meaningful and useful in applications. I think we're going to do some problems where we do that later and see what they're used for. So, but anyway, the place where it touches the x-axis are known as the roots. You could also call them, you should probably write this, x-intercepts. It's the same thing. So x-intercepts are also known as roots. Um, they're also called the zeros. Let's write that too. So they're called the zeros. They're called the x-intercepts. And they're called the roots. Um, now, the place where it touches the y-axis, we know that well from linear functions. That's called the y-intercept. We already know that this is called the vertex. Now the y value, the y value of your vertex is what we call the maximum value or the minimum value. Okay, not the x value. Actually, the x value is, it tells you where your axis of symmetry is. You guys remember that word from algebra 2 maybe? Now, the x value, you can call that your axis of symmetry, but the y value is called the maximum. All right. So all that being said, we're going to do some graphing calculator problems. So I'm going to pause the video. I want you guys all grab the graphing calculator there. I printed that for you? Okay, so first of all, let's clear our calculators, right? Second plus 7, 1, Second plus seven one two. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and graph it first. Do you guys remember how to do that? What do I put first? Y equals. So let's go ahead and push Y equals in the top left corner. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to type this equation into our calculator here. Now, some of you guys have nice calculators that make things look like fractions, and some of you don't. Um, so, just in case you're you're the one that doesn't, my, mine is a calculator that doesn't look nice. So, when in, when you have one of the calculators that aren't nice, you have to put your fractions in parentheses. Okay. So let's go ahead and begin here. So I'm going to start with a parenthesis, and I'm going to do negative one half. So that's negative. Remember, there is a difference between the negative button on the bottom. And the minus button here, if you mix them up, you will get an error signal. So we're going to push negative 1 over 2. 1 divided by 2, close your parentheses. Some, some of you do. Everybody can. You would need parentheses, yeah, the way that it's typing it. Yeah. Huh? What address would you get by following? Well... Were you paying attention, young lady? Bad person. You're a bad person. Are you being judged? Hold on. And judged. Okay. So go ahead and you're going to push this one button right here. Y equals. Okay. 
and then we're typing in the equation. So from here, I'm going to type the rest of it. It's pretty easy. X is right here, this button right here, X T theta N. X squared, here's a nice square button they offer us, so we can just use that. Uh, plus 4X, minus 11. And remember, it's a minus 11, not a negative 11, so minus 11. Okay, so let's push the graph button. Ready? When you're done, push the graph button. Your graph should look like this. Okay? So question number one to you guys. Does this graph have a minimum or a maximum value? It has a maximum because it's upside down, right? And when it's upside down, the highest point would be something we call a max, right? So it has a maximum value. All right, so we got that. Let's, uh, let's find our our vertex. How are we going to do that? Hmm. Tricky, tricky, tricky. What do you say? Second graph. That's, that'll work. I'm kind of curious though. All right. Let me, let me help you guys out. I, I'm going to do it a little bit differently. Now, on your guys' notes here, um, if you guys want to look at number one on the last slide, you guys see it where it says min and max? I've got instructions there. So the first thing says determine if it has a minimum or a maximum. We've already answered that. Does it have a minimum or a max? Okay, what's the next thing it says to do? Min and max. It says determine if the graph has a min or max, and then it says press second. Do you guys see where I'm reading? Number one on the last slide. Are you guys reading this with me? It's hard to tell when nobody talks to me. <laughs> All right, do we see where we're at? Okay. Last slide, number one. It says min and max. Determine if the graph has a min or a max. What does it say after that? There we go. Now you're talking to me. Press second. So we're going to press second. And then what does it say to do? Trace. You guys see where the trace button is? So what does it say after trace? Choose min or max. Which one am I going to choose? Max. What does it say now? Wait, why do you choose max? Because this graph has a max, and we talked about that. If you were on your phones, just letting you know. All right, now, what does it say after you choose max? Pick a point to the left. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to pick a point to the left of our maximum. So you guys see my cursor here? Sometimes you have to scroll around to find it, but there it is. Is that point to the left of my max? Yes. So go ahead and push enter. What does it say to do now? Pick a point to the right. So now I'm going to scroll over here and pick a point to the right and push enter again. And then what does it say to do? I have to pick a point to the right. Yes. So just push enter. It'll tell you. And there's your vertex. All right, so now what's the x value of my vertex? It says 3.9999, which means basically my x value is what? Four. We're just going to say four. And calculators do that. They get close to the right value because that's how they figure things out. Um, so we have to sometimes fix it. If it says 3.999, we know that means 4, okay? And what's the y value of our vertex? Negative 3. Now, we've already said that this graph has a what? Has a max. And what is that maximum value? It's the y value of the vertex. So what is it? y equals? So that first process gives you both of your answers, okay? 
We'll do another example. But what did we do? First of all, we plugged in our equation and we graphed it. We could tell if we had a min or a max. And then we went to second trace. We picked min or max. And you have to do this thing. You pick a point to the left and right. So you're telling your calculator what area to zoom in on to find the min or max. All right. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to find our y-intercept. So did I give you guys some steps for that? Yes. All right. Nick, would you be my reader? You're really close to me. What what does it say? How how do we find the y-intercept? You use second and then trace calc again. Okay, so let's press second and then trace calc again. And then what do we do? It says to select value, uh, type zero, and then press enter. Okay, so we're going to press value. That's number one. And then it says type zero. Yeah. And then press enter. What's my y-intercept? Negative 11. And we could say specifically it's 0, negative 11. Okay? All right. Next, we want to find the roots. So you guys should read along with Nick here as we as he reads it. But go ahead, Nick. What is, what's the first thing we have to do if I want to find the roots? Uh, the same thing, which is to go second and then trace calc. Second, trace, and calc. Uh, it says to select zero. That's right. Remember how I told you the roots were also called the zeros? So we're gonna click we're gonna select zero this time. Uh, it says to choose a point to the left of the root and a point to the right of the root. Okay. I'm gonna stop there on this one. Because what are roots again? It's where it touches the x-axis. What's wrong with me asking for roots here? It doesn't touch the x-axis. So we're gonna say None. It doesn't touch the x-axis. So let's do another one. This time I'm going to let you guys follow the steps that are printed for you there. Okay? Um, and then I'll, I'll give you a little pause time between each one to try it. And then you can see if you got it right. All right. So, ready? Go ahead and um, let's type our equation in first. Go back to y equals and clear it out. And type in your equation. Our new equation is 2x squared minus 16x plus 36. And then graph. Uh, I want some roots this time. Let's. I'm going to change this number. Ah, guys, check this out. You ready? That's what math teachers have to do. I want this to touch the x-axis. If I want this to touch the x-axis, what do I need to do to this shape? I need to pull it down. What do you do to a function if you want it to move down? Lower the shape. You subtract the number on the outside, right? So I'm going to drop that down. It looks like I need to drop it by about maybe, uh, I don't know, at least 5. So I'm going I'm to drop it down by, like, let's say, 8. So let's take 8 off of this. What's 36 minus 8? 28. So let's go back to y equals really quick. And let's change that to 28. Go back to y equals and change that to 28. Now graph it. Oh, same shape. Just got dropped down. Pretty sweet, right? Okay. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and here's what I want you guys to do. I want you guys to find the vertex and the min and max and the y-intercept. I'll help you guys find the roots because we didn't get to do that in the last example. Okay, So go ahead and do the first three here. How are you going to do it? You've got the steps right in front of you. They're printed. Go ahead and follow them. Give you guys a few moments. Yeah, you guys did though. I was doing more helping than checking work as I was out there. Um, George, what did you get for your vertex? I think that's right. Um, and I've already told you guys this one has a minimum. Condiker, what's our minimum value on this graph? Condiker? What's our minimum value? It's just the y value. Yeah. 
All right. Um, next, I'm going to ask Maya again. Um, what's the uh, y-intercept? Yep. Okay, so that, that's good. So I'll show you guys how to do it. You missed it. Um, so to find your vertex, your instructions say press second, trace. And in this case, we want to do a minimum. And I think this is the most confusing part. Um, you have to pick a point that is to the, here's your vertex, right? You have to pick a point that's to the left and to the right of that vertex. So how do you do that? You start with the left, so you're going to use these arrows to scroll around until you see your, your number coming up. You'll see it. You'll see that little dot now? You don't see it in the beginning sometimes because it's off the screen, so you have to keep scrolling until it pops onto the screen. So would you guys agree that dot is to the left of my vertex? Yes. So we're going to push enter. Now we're going to pick a point to the right of my vertex. So now I'm going to scroll some more until I get to the right side of my vertex. And we push enter again. And then finally you push enter one more time and it will tell you your vertex. So there's your four negative four that George told us. And that means our minimum value is negative four. Now we got to find our y-intercept. So the instructions say push second, trace, and value, right? Enters, and we type in zero, and you got your vertex, I'm sorry, your y-intercept, which is off the screen. It's somewhere way up here at positive 28 is where it touches the y-axis. Okay? All right. The last thing we're going to do is I'm going to show you guys how to find roots. Um, so, let's do that. Can you hand me a piece of paper? You guys should read along with me here on this so that you know how to use the instructions, okay? So, number four says roots. It says we're going to push second first, so let's push second. We're going to push trace and calc. It says select zero. And we have that left and right thing again going on. Okay? So do you guys see where the zeros would be at? We have one like right about here and one right here, right? So I'm going to start by focusing on this one. I want to find this point first. So what I have to do is just like I did with the vertex, you have to pick a number to the left of that and to the right of that. So the graph knows where to look for a zero. So the calculator knows where to look. So let's do that. We're going to want left first. So I'm going to scroll over again until I can get to a point. There it is. You see my little dot? So I'm going to put it right about to the left of my dot. Push enter. And now I'm going to pick a point that's to the right of that root. Enter again. And now we guess. And there it is. So it's touching the x-axis at 2.6-ish, we'll say. And the y value is 0. Now you guys can repeat that process for this other dot. Okay, so we want to find this root now. And once again, we need to pick a point that is to the left and a point that's to the right. I see the, the wave of packing up has begun. So. All right, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Uh, go ahead and turn your calculators off and put them in the box on your way out, guys.